This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week we are pleased to be joined by people you may know by their Twitter handle, Ice Fans Arlene LD. But this is Larry and Arlene Dunn, uh, who are, interestingly for our show, not expensively classically trained musicians, but they are people who are very interested in contemporary music um, and spend a lot of time in our community. And they're a, a wonderful benefit to our community. So thank you, Larry and Arlene, for joining us this morning. Well, we're thrilled to be here. So I, I want to start kind of where I, where I was just talking about. You guys didn't uh, come to new music the way that the rest of the panel came to new music. You know, we, we went to school and we often think about, and we're very guilty of this on the show, talking about new music as though it is something that we only make for other musicians, that we only make for other performers and composers and people in our immediate community. Um, and clearly, that's not the end goal of creating art, is just to create it for other artists. And you guys seem to have cracked into our our, our club. And I'm curious <laughs> if you can just maybe describe how you got into new music got interested in the the kind of music that that we all talk about on this show and that you're interested in uh on your own well we've been you know we've been interested in all kinds of music for a long time uh although really you know we we both sort of learned what we learned early about music through um popular music arlene is a big uh, r&b fan in in her youth and you know i was a little behind her and very uh, involved in the kind of uh, album rock, radio, and psychedelic rock, and that kind of thing. Um, but we we got interested in other kinds of music uh, as we grew up, and um, I think that the you know we were very uh, excited about avant garde jazz for a long time, uh, but then we were also getting into more standard classical music things. We were in Chicago, going to hear the Chicago Symphony and the Lyric Opera. Um, and somewhere along there, we discovered, somewhat to our surprise, that there were actually people who were writing more or less in that realm, music that was being you know, written today and, and played by people that were interested in that. Uh, it was not easy to find in Chicago in the 80s. Uh, but we started, I, I think probably the things that we found first were uh, Kronos Quartet and Philip Glass music. Um, sometime in the 80s, Lyric Opera did uh, uh, Philip Glass's Satyagraha Gandhi Opera. Uh, and it kind of blew the top off of our head that these things were, you know, happening today uh, and really exciting. Although it took a while, really, before there was, um, you know, pl any sort of plentiful chances to hear this kind of music uh, in Chicago. Uh, and that started to become more plentiful uh, in the last five or ten years. Yeah, I was thinking uh, how much that's changed. Yeah, yes. exactly. Uh, I mean, the Chicago scene is very vibrant now. And, uh, you know, we probably we started to tap <laughs> into it through 8th Blackbird uh, and things that were happening at the Museum of Contemporary Art, which was a, has a very ambitious and... and uh, fascinating um, performance program every year that is partly about music, uh, but it's also about theater and dance and other things. Uh, and that's how we first uh, first saw ICE was at the at MCA. And so pe for people who aren't familiar with ICE, the International Contemporary Ensemble, they are a, a, a wonderful new music organization that you guys have gotten in, involved in. Uh, and maybe you, could you tell us a little bit about your involvement with ICE? Sure. Um, so we uh, attended a workshop that um, Claire Chase, the executive and artistic director of ICE, put on with uh, a couple of her cohorts um, on ICE Lab, which is um, uh, essentially a program where ICE brings in 
composers to work directly with the musicians and collaborate through a process of uh, creating a piece of music uh, together rather than uh, the composer sitting off in one room writing it all out and handing it off. And um, so they had this workshop, uh, again, at the MCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, on the stage. And this was a free workshop. Anybody could come. Uh, and so we went and sat, you know, there were maybe 25, 30 people on the stage with George Lewis, Steve Lehman, uh, Claire, and um, uh, Eric, Eric Lamb, uh, the other, uh, one of the other flutists um, in ICE. And they played a little music. They talked about uh, the process of creating uh, music, uh, showed a couple of videos. And um, it was just fascinating, and we just thought that this was really exciting. Um, following the workshop, we went up and talked to Claire. Um, I'm usually the person who is uh, willing to just walk up and talk to anybody. <laughs> uh, um, and... Um, so uh, we introduced ourselves, and uh, at that point, we were beginning to think about moving to Oberlin um, at this retirement community that's uh, a mile from the college, and uh, was partly be because of the, we heard that we were reading of that about ICE and Eighth Blackbird, and discovered that they were both formed here, and we thought mm, there was something about the water here. Yeah. So. Uh, so we told her that uh, we were thinking about moving to Oberlin and that it was her fault. <laughs> ah. <laughs> she, just, she just got a real kick out of that. And, and, um, and so we kind of connected. And I discovered uh, in a few days I was looking on the ICE site and realized all their emails were available. And so I, I sent an email to Claire and followed up on this. And um, um, this was just a, uh, a few months before... Actually, it was only about a month before there was um, a um, conference held here at um, the college, um, which is another long story. But then, uh, but we <laughs> that ice but, was playing. Uh, ice was playing at this conference, and uh, we met up with uh, with Claire then, and uh, well, and here we are. We kind of so got sucked into the ice vortex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this, there are, there are worse vortexes to be sucked into. I think, indeed. Um, yeah. So, when you guys hear, I'm curious what your reaction is when you hear a new piece of music, a new challenging piece of music for the first time, um, because I I feel like our reaction is to think about it as as people making it, and I don't know. I, I I'm just curious. What you think when you hear something, you said you got into it through Kronos Quartet, and actually our guest last week also got into new music through Kronos Quartet, and he told us the story of uh, buying a, the Kronos Black Angels album because he'd heard uh, a, a, another a, a rock artist that he was in into sample the recording of Shostakovich that's on that same album. And uh -huh. so he went and sought out the record, and put it on, and the first thing on it is George Crumb's Black Angels. And I'm curious what your reaction was the first time you heard that kind of thing. Well, it's funny. I think the first thing we heard Kronos play was uh, uh, Jimmy Hendrix. Hendrix. Yeah. Huh. Nice. <laughs> I forget which one it is yeah, right now. Uh, Purple Haze. Yeah. Purple Haze. So, I mean, we were already well prepared for that sound. Right fascinated by uh, it being played in that manner. And I, I don't remember that that's a very um, diverse album that the uh, that Purple Haze is on. Uh, I don't remember exactly why I picked it up. Something someone had mentioned this group to us. I don't know who. I think it was around the time. I, I'm not sure what year this was, but I think it was around the time that CDs were new. Uh, and we were just had a CD collection or just had a CD player for the first time. This would be sometime in the mid eighties. Uh, and, uh, that, that CD caught my eye. Uh, and it was, you know, probably one of the first 20 or 25 in our collection. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of which before that were all, you know, real standard kind of classic repertoire, which was the, the first things coming out on CD. Right. Yes. So, 
then it, it, uh, along those same lines, one one difficulty that I at least I don't I don't want to speak for these guys, but at least I have all the time is explaining to people what it is uh, I do as a composer <laughs> and what what kind of music I make. Yeah. Um, and I would imagine that you guys coming to this music more recently have probably more experience trying to explain that to to people than I do. What do you how do you explain this music to people? When you talk about ice. That's a great question. When you talk about ice, what do you tell people about ice? Well, the first words that come to mind uh is exciting. Uh that's that's one of the things that I find so interesting about new music is that it's so exciting. And to me, I'm mostly, I'm reacting emotionally uh, a lot to this, um, to the music. And um, and it, there's so many different emotions that um, I can experience. Um, sometimes it, yeah, I close my eyes and it carries me away. Sometimes I'm just jumping on my seat. I can't, you know, that it's, sometimes it's just freaking me out. Uh, but... Um, you know, one of the things uh, that Larry started to allude to is that um, when we were interested in avant-garde jazz, but we're also both, we have a long history of being risk takers and uh, in in many arenas, not just in our appreciation of art. Um, so uh, I like that part of it too, is being risky and, and um, trying new things and Truthfully, uh, there's many pieces that I walk out and say, I didn't either, either I didn't get that or I didn't like that or something, but um, that doesn't bother me. I'm still, that doesn't stop me from, from going the next time. Right. Well, that's the nice thing about taking risks with music is, you know, the, the, the consequences of, of not liking a piece are pretty much just that. Right. And it's it's much it is it is risky, but the, it has very low consequences. So that's nice. And uh, so what do you do? What is your reaction when you say you it, it freaks you out? What what what's the next step from there? Like, do you do you do you still sit there and try to get what's left out? What what comes after the, the initial freak out reaction? Well, uh, mostly, uh, I, I don't think I can, I've tried to try to figure it out just by being contemplative afterwards, but more, I think I just need to hear it again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. great. So. And that's a, that's a great point of view to have. And I think the thing that Dave keeps pecking on is that you hear a piece that is very challenging and you might think I didn't like it or I didn't get it. And your reaction is. I'm going to need to hear that again. Whereas a more typical reaction, as Dave is hinting at, would be, "Thank God that's over. I never want to be. I never want to be subjected to that again." I mean, so don't, don't leave me alone in a room with that music. I think, I think, yeah. I think we're all still having trouble with the idea of people uh, who think new music is exciting in the way you're talking about <laughs> like the, you, the, the deadpan quality of your response where because it's exciting, it took Dave off guard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to try, I'm going to use that next time. Next time somebody asks me, well, what kind of music do you write? I write very exciting music. Exciting. Music. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if either of you guys, like what your background in writing was because I've read, several pieces of your writing about new music and we were commenting this morning that it's the best music criticism I've read in a while. Yeah. Um, we, I often read things and it's just, it's a fluffy sort of very generic rundown of what happens using only metaphors to describe it in any way. And only and, focusing on the weirdest, strangest right. performance practices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I found it very engaged and, and, and a lot of attention to detail. So I'm wondering, did you like have a writing background uh, earlier in life and now you're applying those skills to, to writing, I mean, to music writing or, you know, what's going on there? Well, I've been an avid writer uh, my entire life, uh, although I have uh, probably um, 
wasted most of that energy prostituting it for business purposes <laughs> uh, and kind of frustrated at never either having the time or making myself take the time to um, you know engage in my writing in things that were more truly interesting to me than you know writing business proposals and reports and you know I wrote thousands and thousands of these things um, and uh, so I think there is part part of the drive to do this you know um, mm -hmm. writing about this kind of an artistic thing like music, a creative thing, uh, is very energizing for me. Uh, Arlene is, grew up not as so much a native writer. She um, is a numbers person. She, uh, you know, she, she uh, majored in mathematics, and she's very mm -hmm. uh, analytical. Um, but she, since I have known her, which is past 45 years now, has always been sort of striving and interested in writing and using writing as a way of expressing herself um, and, and finding that very frustrating because it wasn't coming naturally. So in some ways, the, the, one of the reasons that we've been doing this um, is because it is providing an Arlene an opportunity to write uh, about something exciting to her uh, and uh, we have a very kind of interesting process about how we do this. Uh, in some sense, we kind of force Arlene to write the first draft uh, because she wants the practice writing. And then we do a lot of engaging and pulling from both of our notes, trying to, you know, find the, the way to make. I, I think our, our objective really is to portray the experience to other listeners. You know, we're not trying to really explain it. We're not really we're not really trying to critique what we hear. We're, we're trying to expose the experience. Um, and that probably does make what we do very different than what anybody else writing about this music is doing. Um, you know, many of them have, people who are doing it professionally have some sort of obligation to meet as to how they do it. If we have an obligation, it, it is, we feel an obligation to the rest of the audience and the potential audience um, to um, tell them what this is all about and and expose this experience that we're enjoying so much. One of the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go well, ahead. I was just going to add um, that uh, I, I feel like one of the reasons that we do this and why it is fun and exciting is, is to try and encourage more people to give this a try. Um, yeah, and to and to get more people um, out there, and um, hey, this is not um, this is not going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, uh, you could try it even just for uh, one night and see if there's one piece that speaks to you, um, mm -hmm. essentially. And so that's why it's really uh, we really try to write about the experience and. Um, and that's why I was t saying that to me, it's, you know, my reactions are usually emotional. And that's what we try to bring out in, in, um, in, in the writing. Well, it's interesting because um, you were saying earlier that you're not trying to critique the piece. And I think I understand what you're getting at. But I feel like I'm getting a, a type of critique. I'm getting, a, you know, how the piece hit you. And that's sort of a critique in its own way. Um, and the other thing that I think is the product of you guys um, sort of not being brought up within the tribe and coming to it afterwards is you don't rely on saying it sounds like this and invoking the name of another composer mm -hmm. and saying it sounds like that. And that to me is the cheapest way out. And it's one of the most frequently used devices. Mm. I use it all the time, too. Everybody does. But if I were writing something, I would try not to. So I, I think it's really good. And I, I now that I uh, have found these, I'm going to read a bunch of them. And I wanted you to know, I know you guys have a cool uh, Twitter handle. But if you wanted to launch a secondary thing, at a, a corno metrics at a cor a corno metrics is available on Twitter. Uh-huh. <laughs> Maybe we should lock that down. Uh, <laughs> I think you should. 
So that's I, I think it's interesting, Sam, that you point that out and, and, and Arlene, I'm glad that you, you circled back on that uh that thing that you added, uh that you know, Larry is, I said was talking about one obligation that you have to the audience, and then you, in in a, in, a, in a way, I think, describe a second obligation to the the content itself. Like you, know, you guys are benefiting, of course, the people that read your stuff, but you're also uh, a great a great benefit to the community and the art form as a whole when you when you write really excellent and clear. Uh, uh, articles like that about the music that you're you're drawn to, um, so I think it's just it's it's it like Sam said it's really great writing, um, and it I it I think is of benefit to even people like me whose music is not the subject of the thing, as a person who likes listening to it, but also as a person who makes this music because it's getting more people in, interested in this, in this community. What kind of feedback do you get on the stuff that you write? Well, it's kind of funny. You, you know, we started doing this um, uh, for the ICE blog. And, uh, you know, uh, Claire Chase has this um, kind of um, ir- irresistible uh, personality. <laughs> and... You know, Arlene was starting to say ICE was coming to play in Oberlin. We were in the process of of uh, deciding whether to move here. So we were coming to Oberlin to check out the cultural offerings, you know, because it's a very small town, but there's all these things going on. We wanted to know how good it was. So we were here for this event that ICE was playing on, and it involved music criticism. And um, that got us started writing because they were encouraging the audience to participate. And we were telling... Claire, that we were uh, writing uh, uh, music reviews of these of these events, and she said, "Well, if you're going to write about music, you're going to write for the Ice Blog." <laughs> <laughs> really? So, uh, you know, uh, silly. Oh, I didn't know that. I hardly know it. I mean, <laughs> talk so, about risk takers. She is really a great risk taker. So That's we decided great. to try that, and uh, you know, so I, I think probably this was like February of 2012 or something. When we wrote our first piece for the uh, for the ice blog, and we wrote a, we wrote several um, in succession, um, and not long after there was a, there was a, um, a an ice event in Chicago at MCA, uh, and um, we went up to talk to Claire afterwards, and we were like suddenly mobbed by all the ice people who were there. Uh, <laughs> With this, you know, they were just like over the moon with what we were writing. And we were not prepared for that reaction. I mean, we expected that people would enjoy it. But it was like, you know, this was it was just unbelievable. The kind of um, gratitude they had that somebody was engaging with this music and feeding back what the experience was like. Um, And as we, uh, you know, as time marched on from there, uh, you know, we started meeting people at, uh, at other events in Chicago. Uh, and when this, this whole process of starting to write for ICE also is what put us on Twitter and Facebook. We'd never been there before, and we were just kind of aping what uh, um, what's John, G- uh, Jim, Jim uh, Holt. Jim Holt, who was who's composer Jim Holt and living in Seattle now, was managing social media for ICE at the time. And Friend he was of the show, Jim Holt. Oh, good, good. Yeah. And um, so, you know, when, when Jim would post something, he'd put something on Twitter and Facebook and he'd send me the links. I said, oh, I guess we ought to be promoting this stuff, too. Mm-hmm. And um, so we would go to events in Chicago and people would come up to us and say, hey, you're Ice Fans Arlene LD, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it just started to create like this public that we were not prepared for a public. <laughs> yeah, the fame. You know, you guys are are as uh, you know when when people talk about social media, they talk about all the the hip twenty somethings and how they know how to use the social media. You guys are way better at it than anybody my age. Right. Um, <laughs> and 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 you guys are 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 all and and in fact, you said people come up to you and say, "Oh, you're your ice fans, Ar- Arlene LD." That is exactly the first place that I knew you from uh. was from twitter and then i i found the the other writings that you were doing and the other the other stuff that you were doing on the web um and 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 i don't know if i don't think you mentioned this yet but you're also doing writing for i care if you listen 
right. uh, for for mm-hmm. Thomas De Neville's blog. And, and you, have you guys written for the magazine as well? Uh, yes, our first uh, piece in the magazine is in the latest issue. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a, a profile of the uh, Cleveland-based ensemble Trepanning Trio, uh, which is kind of a, a fascinating uh, group. And uh, they, they have an interesting story and an interesting sound. And uh, that uh, just went up in, in issue six. Wonderful. That's great. Nice. People, if you're not, if you're not uh, subscribing, if you've got... Uh, an iOS device, and you're you're using the newsstand on iOS. You should absolutely find the I Care If You Listen magazine. There's great stuff there. Um, yeah, I believe uh, you can get a, a seven day uh, free subscription uh, to yeah. the latest issue. Yeah, you can get you, if you've not used it yet. Use that free trial and check out this. That sounds like a really interesting article. Um, going there now. Yeah. <laughs> Nate is doing it now as we speak. <laughs> so if Nate hasn't spoken much, it's because he's been reading <laughs> the, the, the latest I Care If You Listen magazine. Um, um, go ahead, Larry and, Ar- Larry and Arlene, I'm, I'm wondering, we've kind of hinted a little bit at a topic I want to address is is where you guys are living and, yeah. and what that environment is like. Uh, but also related to that, I think we can get into that by talking about your making contemporary music workshop it's yeah. at kindle at oberlin um and you actually recruited a friend of the show marina shim uh, of uh, and chris jones of ab duo to come and take part right. so why don't you tell us about that project and then we'll talk about the the environment that makes that possible also well the uh actually following to what arlene was saying about the um you know kind of approaching people uh to get them to give contemporary music a try um we, uh, you know, we, we look at this as, as a, <clears throat> a need to get people to kind of lower their barriers, lower their resistance and open their ears. Uh, I think we got that from Jim, Jim Holt. My ears are open. Okay. Um, but the, uh, you know, it actually started with something that ICE does uh, with young children um, called the listening room, which is you know, basically getting to children before they have any biases about music or any preconceived notions and just get them engaged in making music and recognizing from the very beginning that music is what you say it is. Uh, And we were trying to think of some way, you know, how could we use the listening room um, to get older people to kind of return to that childlike innocence and take in some new music without preconceptions? Uh, and I think it probably is also modeled after that workshop that ICE did at MCA uh, yeah. with George and uh, and uh, Eric and, and Steve Lehman. Um, that we so we came up with this idea to you know try to move the music off the stage, um, sit around in a circle, have some musicians and composers um, play a little, talk a little, um, get people engaged in asking questions. Uh, and, uh, we did the first one we did was with AB duo and it was a huge, um, success somewhat beyond our expectations. We had about 35 of our fellow residents, uh, came on a, a terrible, uh, blizzard day. Uh, there were a number of people from town that were going to come, but nobody could make it. The weather was so bad. Uh, and people were completely engaged. You know, some of them said afterwards, uh, I'm not sure I really like the music, but I love the workshop. Uh, others, uh, this this is, I never thought about music this way, and that was really interesting. And um, But the, the most common reaction we got was, when are you going to do it again? Yeah. Uh, so we are working on one now with a, uh, um, a composer and some performers who are students at the conservatory. Uh, although <laughs> conservatory <laughs> students are hard to schedule, yeah. as you sure. probably remember from being one. So. Uh, let me just say a little bit uh, about this community, um, which, you know, which is why we're we're trying to do these workshops. So this is a um, a continuing care retirement community, um, an hour a mile, like I said, a mile uh, from campus. Um, it was actually founded by um, a group of uh, uh, professors and other and staff um, and some other folks um, who, who are living in Oberlin when a particularly, um, you know, friend of the community 
uh, had to leave to find a place to live that could um, that that would be comfortable for him in his old age. And so people said, well, we can't be losing the best of our community, and they formed a group to uh, to build this. And the first um, uh, residents moved in uh, just uh, a little over 20 years ago in 1993. Uh, a lot of them are um, have been professors. Many, many are uh, Oberlin grads. Um, but but they still the o- Oberlin connection it still only represents about 40%. So there's 60% of us who have come here, um, and many of those, like us, came because of the conservatory. Um, And so there are a lot of music lovers in this community. Um, They all go to the artist recital series that uh, Oberlin College puts on that brings in uh, um, star performers from around the world. Um, they many of them go to lots of recitals, um, uh, but they have many of them. Most of them, um, I'd say, have a resistance to new music, uh, and so um, we think we're we're the crusaders out there. We're missionaries. <laughs> so, um, for example, I've had conversations with people, and um, you know, I've asked them, uh, "Well, do you like Philip Glass?" "Oh, yeah, I like Philip Glass." Uh, well, did you like Philip Glass first time you heard? Oh, well, maybe not. So these are the kinds of doors we're trying to open. This workshop was, uh, as Larry said, it was just beyond our expectations and the success that we feel is that uh, it had. So well, we're excited. We'll see. Yeah, that's it's great that that you're you're connecting with those um, kind of educational workshops. I think. <coughs> You know, we talk about, and you said people kind of have these ideas about what classical music is supposed to be, and it's definitely not supposed to sound like Philip Glass, much less George Crumb. Um, yeah. <laughs> but when when you work with kids, they don't have those expectations, and you guys are in a in some ways trying to break down those expectations for people that have already spent years building them up. Um, right. And so that's it's it's just such such great work, um, and um, those those workshops sound really fun. Uh, I would I would love to 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 read about the next one when when it happens. Um, uh, you have do you have anything in mind for it? Well, we have. Uh, there's a young uh, c- composer who's about to graduate uh, named Peter Kramer, who's doing some really um, interesting work. He's also uh, a harpsichordist. Ooh, uh, and we were re- recently at his uh, senior recital, um, and uh, we're actually we're we're focused on three of his pieces, uh, hoping that we can get the people who play two of them uh, all in the same room at the same time. <laughs> uh, one of them is a, a is a, a a flute trio. Uh, there's an interesting recording of it out there. Uh, and a video, um, I can s- send you a link to it if you're interested. Great. Um, another is a. Uh, Tell me the name. It's called Wedge. Oh, it's called Wedge. <laughs> yeah, by Peter Kramer. Wedge. Uh, another one is um, is a duo for violin and viola. Uh, both of those have some interesting. When I'm talking to Peter about them, they're both um, yeah. kind of interesting in a way that there's. There's really only one line of material, um, but the, the the performers are working out amongst themselves sort of where they come in and out of the line, and it you know ends up with these um, really interesting overlaps and uh, a lot of overtones coming out because of the way they choose to overlap, and they're they're both really exciting pieces, uh, and then a really exciting uh, piano solo one as well um, called Hush. Uh, but so far, we've had a hard time getting everybody um, on a, a day that they could be here when the room is available. That's uh, not ten o'clock at night, since a lot of the people who would come are sleeping, and right. you know it's a, it's a challenge. But we're we we haven't given up the ship yet. Yeah, well, that sounds great. I want to I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, another project, and this is actually the the impetus for getting in touch with you guys to begin with. We've we've mentioned our mutual friend Mirna Shim was telling me about this 
really cool composition project that you guys are working on. So maybe, yeah. and, and I've got this, you sent me a, a score of it uh, a few weeks ago. I've got that. So if you want to talk about that, I can, I can show it in the video. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about this composition project that you guys are working on. Yeah, well, it um, this uh, kind of it, it grew out of uh, the Uncaged Toy Piano Festival in New York, in which was in December. This was the I don't know third or fourth year. Another snowstorm. Another snowstorm, <laughs> uh, which we got involved in because of Phyllis Chen, who's an ICE member and is the the brains behind this uh, Toy Piano Festival. Um, and I don't think that we. We probably didn't know anyone played toy piano seriously until we discovered that Phyllis did. Um, and we went to a solo show she did, and yeah, right. we're very fascinated by um, by everything about it, really. Uh, so the last time we were in New York uh, was overlapping with part of the festival. We were able to get there. And, uh, you know, the, so the festival has a call for scores every year, and there's three or four or five people who are awarded something, and their scores are played and whatnot. And one of the um, one of the honorable mention winners this year was Danny Clay, who's a uh, composer in San Francisco. I believe he um, actually, I believe he originally comes from Ohio, but he went to San Francisco Conservatory. Um, and he is also a, a teacher of uh, elementary school music uh, for for he teaches first through fifth graders. Um, so we got to know him. Uh, at the festival, he did a really cool. He didn't actually have a piece played. He made a video that involved um, Phyllis playing the graphical scores of his of his kids in school, who made graphical scores for Phyllis to play, and then um, that all got shipped to Phyllis. She played them all, and Danny put the whole thing together in this really neat video. Uh, so a, a few weeks after the festival. Danny put something out on the on uh, Facebook uh, saying, fellow composers, please help me out. Uh, I've asked all of my classes to create their own notation systems, and they're having fun making uh, music, but they're complaining that it's not real music uh, because real composers aren't using these notation systems. So he was asking fellow composers, would you take one of our notation systems and write a piece for the kids to play so they'll they'll understand that this is as real as any any kind of music. So I sent something to Danny and, you know, oh, this is this is so cool. It's, it looks like a lot of fun. And he shot something right back and says, well, why don't you do it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. We're not sure. composers. We don't know anything about it. And we don't really know. I mean, uh, you, you know, we've never – well, Larry's taken – uh, an introduction to music or oh, music, music appreciation, appreciation class. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, uh, much, I've yeah. never taken a music. Well, you know. So. Although we have learned a lot from interacting with composers oh, yes. and performers the last mm -hmm. few years. So. Yes, we have. It's not like we don't know anything. Right, <laughs> but I mean, it's all been self self study sort of yeah. thing. So yeah. So we figured, well, you know, it can't hurt to try. So, so Danny sent us the the uh, second graders uh, music key, which they had invented. Um, and we set out to figure out how could we turn this uh, into a composition and communicate it back to the kids what to do, um, you know, which was all, I, I don't know, Dave, exactly what you have to. So I've got the, the, whole, the, the whole list of pages you sent me, so I don't know what, what you want to, I can show you that key. Yeah, so, so like just... page, on page two has the sound. Yeah. Right. And you can see, uh, I don't know if, uh, how well, uh, is, I guess that's going to be occupying a fullish screen when people look yeah. at it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, so their, their, their instruments and their notation are things like, a, a, you know, an empty plastic water bottle and a writing object and scratch the desk and riffle the book and shake mm -hmm. some pencil lead and this sort of thing. Um, so the first thing that was obvious was there's, there's no point in using like musical staff paper because, you know, there's no tonality in these. These are all, you know, like uh, untuned yeah, percussion one. instruments. It's just, you know, it's an interesting sort of percussion ensemble. So that was our first realization was we need to think about this as as uh, percussion instruments. Um, 
And then, you know, as you, if you looked at acornometrics at all, you'll see the, the whole thing was kind of inspired by John Cage and the John Cage Centennial. And um, we quickly realized that uh, chance operations were going to be extremely uh, beneficial and prevent us from having to, you know, to think rationally about how this thing ought to go together and just let, you know, Mother Chance help us out. Uh, so we started doing things like you'll see in the first, those numbers on the sound key page, um, those are numbers that we assign to each um, element by rolling dice. Uh, because we figured we, we, you know, we're thinking about, well, what is music? You know, it's, it's sound, it's, it's sound over a sequence of time. We're going to have to put these sounds in some sort of sequence uh and we just think started thinking about it in terms of you know lining them up in order in some order uh and, and once we gave them numbers now we we could not have to draw all that stuff but start building the composition just by manipulating the numbers on a sheet of paper and and, and that helped to ensure that we would use all of the instruments right right and without us having to think uh Oh, gee, we haven't used the water bottle in a while. We ought to bring it back in. So, by using chance, that sort of ensured that uh, that we would use them all. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so once we had them numbered, we started uh, playing around with the dice to create these three-note cells. And then, if you turn to a couple more pages, there's something called Group A. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you, if you look at the first two cells at the top, that's all six of the instruments are included there. Mm -hmm. So this was our. This is how we the, the basic sort of beginning, and we rolled the dice again to say uh, I can't remember exactly how we got it to be so that the pencil leads were the first one. And well, yeah. Uh, so we well we built we we built these. Um, two three-note cells, and then we built two more uh, using the dice to assign which which uh, which one went first. I mean, I forget right. what is the number on the right. on the leads, but you know the first thing that came up was a two. Uh, right. So we just built these all in, in numbers. So it was like yeah, at so first it was two, two four uh, two four one. Two four, two, four, one, one. Yeah. and then whatever. And then we did it over again. And we had these, uh, so we had these six cells of three notes. Um, and then four, we four decided cells. that we, four cells uh, I'm sorry, four cells of three <laughs> notes each. Yeah. So we got tw 12 cells uh, or 12, 12 uses of the notes, let's say. Right. Uh, then we decided that we also needed to have dynamics involved. Um so we did this really just with the odd and even on the dice that, you know, if it came up even, I, I, well, I don't know which one it was, but if it came up odd, it was loud. If it came up even, it was soft. And that gave us the way to kind of distribute some dynamics into the, into the work. That was all before we actually figured out how to do this pictorially. <laughs> uh, and then we wanted to get some rhythmic variety. So we, we did the um, use the dice again. Uh, to determine, um, we we thought of the of each cell as having twelve beats, and then we determined whether you would have one, two, or four four beats in the sense of how many times do you do that action. So we can sort of think as the first pencil led as being four quarter notes. Right. Then the instrument is one whole. The writing instrument is one whole note, and then the scratching was four quarter notes again. And, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And then, guys, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, when then we came up with this concept, or maybe we always had the concept that it was going to be a fugue, because we figured, uh, well, we can do a pretty simple fugue by doing uh, like a just a simple uh, round, and and which we all did when we were kids, and um, but we knew that the. Uh, the other groups didn't want to sit around and wait until the um, the first group got a couple of bars in. So we started. So let's see. Actually, it's easiest to see on the front page. 
Oh the, yeah, the front page there yeah. with the uh, with the cars. Yeah. So. Um, so we have these rotations. It looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So the second the second line is shifted one car over, and the last car in the first line wraps around to the beginning, because we didn't figure that second graders were going to be willing to sit there and wait while other people were playing, and that they all had to play from the beginning. This would be a uh, great demonstration of phasing, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> you then know, the, and then we oh, go ahead, Sam. Well, it's just really interesting that this was done as part of the centennial celebration for Cage. Because I don't know, I don't know if you guys did any investigation on Cage's sort of compositional practice, <laughs> like the describing where you draw a matrix and then you roll dice and you start filling it up with stuff. That is like a hundred percent just like John Cage at certain points in his career. Yeah, well, we looked into it pretty deeply actually. That that um, we have this interesting symmetry with uh, with Cage and Cunningham. Uh, that we're we are also seven years apart in age, mm. uh, so every time and we are on the same decade right. links as those two. So every time there's a, like a Cage hundredth birthday was Arlene's seventieth birthday, <laughs> and Cunningham's hundredth birthday will be my seventieth birthday. Oh. Uh, so we've had this symmetry with them. Uh, so Arlene's seventieth birthday was coming. And we were all excited about the John Cage Centennial for other reasons. Uh, and, you know, part of all this that you see is actually related to my obsessive personality. <laughs> um, I'm starting to catch that, I think. <laughs> so I decided to have uh, to make a John Cage Centennial event for Arlene's birthday. And you'll find wow. this an acorn of efforts. You'll find this. Um, so that we is built true thing, love. So we built this thing called Dinner by Chance. And um, we kind of, it was a mashup of John Cage and uh, um, Chopped, the, the, the cooking show called Chopped, where you get this mystery basket and yeah. you, you cook what's in the basket. Um, but we made our teams of, so we invited people overall who like to cook, and we made our teams of chefs by rolling the dice and matching people up to be chef teams. And we did our selection of everybody brought ingredients and uh -huh. out of the master basket, we picked which ingredients who had to cook by chance. And then we made these menus and, uh, and our sister-in-law who went to Grand Valley uh, is a dancer and she spent some time studying with Cunningham. And so she brought in a whole wow. dance element and she taught us all uh, some Basically. Cunningham dance concepts. And then every team also had to build and perform a dance during the evening. <laughs> and, uh, and Dan DeHan, who the composer that, oh, yeah. uh, well, actually, I think you mentioned him, Nick, while we were, while we were down. Um, we needed, I wanted a random timer, alarm timer. And he built us a random alarm timer in Max MSP. And we set that thing off to to ring at random times during the evening. And every time it rang, somebody had to pick up the iPad and read an indeterminacy story. And there's an indeterminacy website where you hit a button and it randomly brings up a story. And so at random times during the night, somebody had to pick up the iPad and read an indeterminacy story. And we did the last and we did and we did some masastics as well. Masastics. And, uh, oh yeah. And it's that's all posted that's on all... Acorn and Metrics. You'll find oh, it. Oh, we had a fabulous time. <laughs> you guys, you guys might, uh, you guys might know this piece that's on on, on the poster on the wall behind me. Actually, this, well, you can kind of see it here. This is uh, this is a, a cage from oh, yeah. Cage oh, Aria. Yeah. yeah, where you've got these different colors that that indicate different kinds of of singing, different styles of singing you're supposed to do in different languages and. Uh, anyway, this just reminded me of that. But yeah. that sounds like the coolest party I've ever heard yeah. of. Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> it was pretty exciting. It took a long time to figure out what to do. Well, yeah. it sounds like it was a blast. Yeah, it oh, was a blast. Yeah. It was a blast. Yeah, yeah actually, the it... poster uh, that poster is the score for a piece that Ice did uh, in one of their Cage Centennial celebrations. Yeah, um, the mezzo soprano Jessica Azodi uh, sang with them. I think her name is Jessica. Maybe do I have it right? I know. She's out in 
I think she's actually from Australia. But we actually have that's uh, one of our ice blog pieces uh, has that score, a picture of that score in it. Yeah, and, and this, it's it's such a. I mean, it's it's one of those things where the score is as as is as beautiful an object as the yeah. the piece is a, a beautiful work of music, um, and it's one of a few pieces that that Boozy sell. Like I didn't have this made; I just got it from the the Boozy site. They sell uh-huh. they sell them yeah. posters of that that page of of Cage and this page of of Crumb, um, yeah. but uh, that's the, so, such a cool thing that that you guys are, are doing that party man i'm so jealous <laughs> I, know. I think you two are officially the coolest people that, <laughs> that i've heard of <laughs> I, 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 go ahead sam you guys you guys had kids no no, no kids uh, too. <laughs> my wife and i are doing the same thing so you you could spend your life making yourself better I, i'm with you on that one <laughs> but Having said that, I wish you guys were my parents. Like, you would be the coolest parents ever. Well, Claire has uh, adopted us as her grandparents. <laughs> yeah. awesome. She calls us Granny and Grandpa Ice. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Show title. That's good. Um, um, you guys are also involved in another project. <laughs> yeah, um, right. <laughs> Metafields.org. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this um, is, this is a, a burgeoning effort. Um, there's still not a huge amount of content on the website, but it's sort of designed to be an archive of what they call uh, like the time-based arts. In other words, like music and theater and dance and this kind of thing. So why don't you tell us about it? Well, this is something that was um, started by Ross Carr, who's a percussionist for ICE and um, I think now is production manager. And he... If you go to the ICE website and look at their videos, most of them have been uh, have been done by uh, by Ross. He he uh, coordinates and produces all that video, which is really great. And um, he started this sometime. I think probably maybe the beginnings of it were late last year. Uh, and he's really looking at at you know, 2014 as kind of a beta year for this. Um, the idea is to create a um, a a searchable uh, a searchable database of these kind of uh, artistic works. Uh, you know, I think probably the in some sense the primary focus is music because that's his thing. But there's some dance and theater things there as well. And I think mm-hmm. the idea is to you know capture uh, into this catalog a um, you know. In some sense, any kind of art that is that is uh, susceptible to being recorded in video or audio, because it, the things that that are being cataloged are are audio and video works uh, that are out in the internet. Uh, it is not a, something that is meant to store all these things. Uh, it is an index to these things wherever the artists have chosen to store them. Mm-hmm. And the idea is to is to build a uh, metadata database about the works that is more comprehensive and um, searchable on every field, uh, unlike many places where the works may actually be stored on the internet, where the the most the most frequent thing you would find is they've been tagged for searching mm-hmm. in a in an internet sense, but they're not really they're they're not in a database. And the idea is to build a database of all these works. Yeah. Um, so, the, and this was something that really appealed to me because uh, I have a background in computer science, uh, and I am uh, an irrepressible cataloger. Um, mm-hmm. That uh, you know, I I that I, I bet like you have a great things. organized <laughs> iTunes library. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's, you know. This, this sort of touches on a theme that we address on the show all the time, and it's about uh, classical music generally, but I think it's even a bigger deal with new music because they're often the product of collaborations and lots of different people yeah. are involved, is metadata generally for that, generally for that music. And, uh, you know, Dave, <laughs> that's one of Dave's political stump points is metadata and Spotify and these kinds of services. So it's interesting. You, I keep finding, we keep running into you guys knowing about things that are common concerns for me 
Yeah. And you guys have the same concerns. Like metadata for classical music is terrible. <laughs> well, if I were to have sent you a note in, in our notes ahead of time, what should you not ask me about? <laughs> metadata would be the answer. <laughs> and it's only because I can talk about it probably for the next <laughs> hour. We, 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 perhaps, I, perhaps next time we'll have it. We'll do another show yeah. about metadata, and we'll have we'll have you on to, to tell us all about it. Well, it, 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 it might be interesting to talk some more about it uh, offline before we would do that. I, yeah. I, as, as a computer scientist, I, I am incensed by what I see. <laughs> hey, so you're not supposed to start talking about it. Um, we told you sound, to bring up that word. A Sound Notion special event. We'll release it. It's called That's Larry right. and Dave. Larry and Dave harp about metadata. <laughs> we need to get our buddy Tim on that show though too. Yeah. I do. I want to say one thing, one little reaction to your calling us the coolest people. Uh, <laughs> through this, I want to just say that um, since we have started writing um, on blogs, we have met the coolest people, and and we have made so many cool friends, um, uh, including now you three. So, um, but. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit offline when the video went with about Dan DeHan, and Dan yeah. is definitely a person who's become a good friend, and, um, you know, we've spent many hours with him talking about the process of composing. Um, I'm going to screw up the name, because, you know, the piece. Oh, Trump Lacour. Trump Lacour. So we do... Uh, this has opened so many doors to us um, it, that it, it's so full, really fulfilling. And um, so take a chance out there. You know? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we have found the same thing doing this show is that we have gotten to meet some, some just really wonderful people. Um, and, and people are so open on, uh, that, that, are, that are doing these kinds of things in, in public and on the web. People are just so open to come and talk and chat and 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 like you said, they're just it's so fun to talk to them. Even even if the content was a separate thing, just hanging out with these people is is, is such a great experience. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So yes, uh, and and maybe that that's a, a good way to wrap up the 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 interview part of the show. Um, we've got there a few we have to cover. Oh, there's oh. one thing we absolutely have to cover. Uh oh. Okay. Osmo is back. Osmo is back. Yeah, Osmo. Official. Cosmic Osmo. Osmo Vanska. That's a question for us. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, if, if, if you've been if, if listening to the show or watching the show at all over the last year, uh, <laughs> you may have heard us talk about the Minnesota Orchestra and all of their problems that they have had. And one of the big uh, points of that labor dispute was when Osmo Vanska, the wonderful music director of the Minnesota Orchestra, left the ensemble in, uh, I guess it was around September of last year, because uh, they weren't playing any music, and he's a conductor, and he conducts orchestras, and there wasn't one for him to conduct in Minneapolis. Uh, and so he was getting very frustrated. He gave him an ultimatum. He said, if, if you're not back by this date, then I have to go, and they were not back, and he left. And so there was a big butting of heads between Osmo and Michael Henson, the president of the orchestra. Uh, as we reported a month or so ago, Michael Henson left, and Osmo Vanska has now returned. So hopefully we can uh, continue to get some great stuff. I think he signed a two-year contract with the orchestra, so hopefully he'll get back to doing all the wonderful things that he had been doing to that point. Um, they they had been working on a complete cycle of reco a recording of the Sibelius symphonies, the first two of which have been released and were both nominated for Grammys, the second of which won a Grammy. So it's really they're really great recordings. If you like Sibelius's music at all, you should definitely check out um, these Sibelius symphony recordings. Um, and then this this next one, uh, Hal Leonard. This is a this is a big. I don't know if yeah. this is going to turn out to be a big thing. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't change too much of what's going on there. But we talked over the summer, last summer, to Joe Berkowitz uh, of NoteFlight, uh, one of the founders of NoteFlight, which is a web-based uh, notation 
application. So it's a web app. Foundation it runs in your web browser. It's it, say what, Sam? Sound Notion 127. Yes. <laughs> Check out Sound Notion 127 if this is something that interests you. Um, but it's there's a free version of it, which is wonderful for education, and it's a very low cost to subscribe to get the premium version. Um, so it's it's got some great education features. It it does a, it's not going to replace your super powerful you know ProJock desktop Sibelius or Finale anytime soon or whatever Steinberg is coming out with. Uh, <laughs> but it is a really great tool, and it was just acquired by Hal Leonard this last. week. Uh, week or two, or I don't remember exactly when. It was sometime in the last few weeks. But uh, you can read a, an announcement about it on the NoteFlight blog. Um, they say that it's not going to change much of what they do. It will obviously mean that they've got a lot more resources. We hope that the, we don't <laughs> see the same thing happen to NoteFlight that happened to the Sibelius team when they got bought by Avid. Um, but we're cautiously they're, optimistic at the moment, I would say. I think they're going from a place where it's like carefully planning for the future to a money is no object in terms of development kind of <laughs> environment. Well, I well, think it's, this it's will, an object, but it's very different for them. It would be great if they could hook into the Hal Leonard library and be able to somehow interact that. with the, the, the music that Hal Leonard has the rights to print. Um, and and maybe they can distribute music through the Note Flight platform, and you can do do. There are all kinds of great distribution opportunities, I think, for for Hal Leonard's current um, library, paired with the really intuitive um, notation interface of Note Flight. Larry, Arlene, have you guys ever uh, played around with anything like this, doing doing uh, traditional music notation? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you ever want to give it a shot, this is a great free thing that you could play with uh, at Note Flight. Um, it's easy to do uh, online collaborative things where different people contribute. Yeah, you can you can share a score. Times. Yeah, and so it might be doing something like that would be a way for yourself to learn very easy notation. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Because if you can think computers and you can think that way, the way music notation works can click in your brain very quickly. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think we we, we have a we have a very uh, minimal handle on how it works. I think what we lack is talent. We can play. <laughs> no, yeah. no. We've never had any talent for playing. Well. Uh, we will we will certainly look forward to to seeing what comes from from this new uh, partnership or I guess not partnership this this new business relationship between um, <laughs> Hal Leonard and Note Flight and we'll we'll let you know if there's anything cool that happens there. In this last one, if you like robots and you like Legos and you like suspended symbols, oh, yeah. <laughs> boy howdy does Sam Mercier's have a story for you. Uh. This guy, I don't even know his name, and we'll, we'll have it in the notes. He built a, a robot that plays electronic music, and it's cool to look at, and it's interesting to remember. Dave, are you going to play that video for us? Uh, I'm not set up to, sorry. Okay. So anyway, it's interesting because he uses code and electricity to build a Lego robot that physically activates potentiometers that cue more electricity and code that generates electronic music. Oh, really? So he's putting in code and getting out motion and putting in the motion to get more code, which equals music. Right. That's, <laughs> which I think seems, is amazing. That's, a, that's a lovely 21st century Rube Goldberg machine, if I've exactly. ever heard of one. It's yeah. a pretty incredible machine he has built. It's, right. It's, video, yeah. is, video is very engaging in that it it kind of is homing in on the, the – it's you know like a table-sized installation, and as you home in on it, you hear the noise of all the little Lego gears and things working, and then you have like a Matrix kind of – where you, you were putting on the virtual headphones because it shows the guy reaching for headphones because that's the way it's experienced. This installation, you walk up and there's headphones. So then you put on the virtual headphones, and then you hear the music that's being generated – but in a sense, there's music being generated already. You know, there's this rhythmic noise because all the the, mm -hmm. the rhythmic quality of the robot is 
it's giving the rhythmic quality of the music. The electronic music is syncopated and accurate rhythmically because the robots are doing physical operations accurately and rhythmically. Wow. It's a really interesting thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Listen to it. Acoustically, you're hearing all the stuff, and then you just hear a different version of it when you put on the headphones. Huh. Mm-hmm. His name is Alex Almont. Might be pronouncing that correctly, but it, the the piece is called Playhouse, or the, that's the whole installation. And it, he built it for a, a music festival in Oxford, England, called Audiograft. And uh, it's it's just a really interesting thing because it's like you look at this whole texture of Legos moving and <laughs> doing this undulating kind of thing happening with wires going into this other interface, and and looks like a different synthesizer happening. It's just. It's a really intriguing video to see, and I can only imagine having it, like experiencing it in person, where you get all the and mechanical you, motion and sounds, like Sam was describing. I think it's a great. I mean, this you might think this is silly, but I think it's a great youth engagement tool because it's mm-hmm. made out. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so like, they're immediately the same way you can have a cartoon on about anything. It can be about you know thermal dynamics in you know offshore drilling environments or something. <laughs> but it's a cartoon. Kids are gonna go cartoon, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so so that's the whole that's the whole Lego Mindstorm thing to get kids into engineering, right? Is the b- building those. Ro- I, I'm sure that's the basis for this this project is the Lego Mindstorm thing, where you have robot controlled things that are all based around Lego, and that's a, a, one of the the uh, the really nice kind of educational missions that Lego has taken on is to have their stuff used to teach these kind of engineering concepts, which is, I think, how a lot of engineers get into or interested in those kinds of, of problems. And maybe, Larry, you can you can speak to this with your engineering background, is they, they had uh, creative, constructive toys as kids, things like erector sets and Legos that, you know, let you build stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean I think this is great and that that it's being connected to music now. Um, I kind of pre- we did have uh, erector sets when I was a kid, although I never had one. But we were uh, more into uh, Tinker Toys. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> that's that's going to do it for us this morning. Uh, Larry and Arlene, uh, or I should say, Granny and Grandpa Ice. <laughs> uh, you know, thank you so much for for joining us this morning. Uh, do you guys? We've been talking about a lot of your web projects. Do you have any anything that that you want to plug before we go? Where 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 should people go if if, if people want to find the central uh, uh, Arlene and Larry Dunn place on the web that that that, that will get them to all of your your various projects? Where 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 should they go? Well, Acornometrics on Tumblr is our uh, personal blog where lots of things go. Um, and that has links to, you know, we, we do a review of what we've written and every, every year and yeah, there's like a so big index, index available index there. there. Yeah. Plus, plus personal things. And yeah, there's uh, a lot of other kinds of stories on, uh, acornometrics that aren't about music too. Uh, and, uh, the Twitter feed, usually whatever we're doing is getting promoted on the Twitter feed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, that. that that is great, and we are so pleased to have been able to talk to you this morning. Thank you so just, much for your time. Just thanks for having us, and this has been a real blast. Yeah. It really, it has. It's been a lot of fun. Well, we will have links to uh, Arlene's and Larry's Tumblog and Twitter feed and all the cool things that they've got going on in the show notes for this episode of Sound Notion. You'll be able to find those <coughs> at our site for this show, soundnotion.tv slash sn. If you'd like to find all the links to all the things that we've been talking about this morning, some really great projects that you might want to read some more about. You can also, if you have any thoughts on any of the things that we talked about, um, share your thoughts there in the comments, or you can connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, we are at, at, at Sound Notion as a group. Um, I am at Dave McDow. Sam is at Housegoy. Nate is at a Nate Tree, and Arlene and Larry are at Ice Fans Arlene LD. Uh, so you should definitely check those out if you're on Twitter. Definitely a great follow, uh, Arlene and Larry. 
and um, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and those are all places where we would love for this conversation to continue. You can subscribe to this show and all of our shows in the iTunes store or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. Um, <laughs> if you'd like to support the show, you can use the little Amazon search affiliate box on our site. Um, just go there to search for whatever you're, you're already planning to buy on Amazon, um, and we get a tiny little commission uh, from from the purchase, it doesn't cost you anything, but uh, we get a little kickback for sending you there. Um, so we really appreciate that. It, it helps us out a lot. Uh, it's I, it's a small little thing, and it helps us out a lot. So thanks to everyone who has done that. And uh, if 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 that's something you're interested in doing, continue to do that. And you can also donate using the links on our site as well. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again so much for watching or listening, and we will be back next week.